All right. Recording in progress, I think. All righty. Well, hello and welcome to the Studio Utani podcast. Uh, I'm Matt. I'm Baker. Justin. Oh. Oh. Baker, oh. Justin. Whoa, whoa, we got some miscommunications going on. I'm joined today by <laughs> Baker and Justin. And uh, another one. Yeah. Another one with the th- with the uh, with the three of us, the the main trio. Um, so yeah, today uh, we got some interesting things to talk about. We all went to go see Eternals the uh, the other night, and we mm. are uh, excited to kind of talk about it. I'm interested to see uh, what you guys thought of that because you, you kind of were we we're talking a little bit about our initial uh, impressions. The night that we uh, that we went, but um, we didn't really go super in depth with it. Um, right, it's all sunk in now. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, you know, first off, we do have uh, you know a little bit of a interesting story here. I was um, I, I knew that um, the uh, the Blade Runner anime Black Lotus was coming out pretty soon, um, but. I didn't realize it was actually coming out um, next week. Uh, and there was an interesting um, sort of behind the scenes featurette from the show's creators uh, talking about it a little bit. And um, it seems interesting for sure. I don't know if you guys uh, looked at that at all. Uh, I, I watched the trailer. I did not see this behind the scenes thing. Yeah. Well, they, I mean, they were talking about trying to kind of reference the world of Blade Runner but also show sides of it that really haven't been seen before so they wanted it to be something unique and special and one of the the people that's like uh, I think he's either one of the writers of the show or or showrunner or something he he talked about like not wanting to become super dependent on some of the established mythology because he didn't want to trivia trivialize any of it and i'm like huh okay that kind of that kind of makes sense because blade runner is a very unique franchise in that uh almost anything that's come out of it like we've had two uh blade runner films that are both masterpieces and then we also had a blade runner anime shortly before the second film came out which was uh blackout uh, which sort of set up some of the backstory that was in um 2049 um i think wanting to kind of continue that legacy and you know that you know mythology and that lore and that in that world in a way that feels special and unique and has integrity i think is you know a good approach to it sure i get that <laughs> i wasn't in love with the art style of this this was my first yeah. thought yeah it's kind of a it's kind of a photorealistic 3d um or not not necessarily photorealistic but it's the uh, yeah it's kind of it, it looks kind of dated well i mean they try it's 3d animation and they uh, they're trying to make it look like animation and not uh right the right. opposite of what i just said which is photorealism right um, a little stylized i guess yeah which you know i, I was also about. like i don't think maybe i don't remember some blade runner lore but i don't remember anyone actually just running with a blade and that seems to be what the jumping off point was for this. It's like, oh, wow, we're and, finally going to pay off that title. <laughs> right. <laughs> it, which, you know, it's funny because Ridley Scott, you know, Blade Runner was the name of a completely unrelated novel. And I'm not even sure what that novel was about. But Ridley Scott's like, I like that title. He bought, <laughs> the, can't just he bought, do that. bought the rights to the title just so he could name the movie that. It's, it's kind of ridiculous, honestly. <laughs> That is pretty ridiculous. I can't imagine though Blade Runner would have the uh, legacy it, it did if they called it Android Stream of Electric Sheep. That's kind of oh, it wouldn't. And yeah. people who like the uh, Philip K. Dick uh, short story uh, would hate the movie. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, because it only sort of you know it, it, it's very very loosely based in some of the ideas in that story. Hmm. Yeah. And I guess this character has some amnesia, or she's a replicant, maybe. Well, she is a replicant. That's what they were talking about. Sure. Yeah, she is a replicant, and um, it looks like 
you know, she might be kind of a replicant that's hunting down Blade Runners, which that's different. Sure. I, yeah. I mean, I mean, not terribly different. I mean, we kind of had that in the uh, in the first one, but in the, in that case, a baddie and, and the gang were more. They were looking for um, uh, Tyrell, right? They were looking for Tyrell to try and yeah, you know, see if he could extend their lifespan. But in this one it kind of looks like we might have a replicant that's going after the hunters of replicants and that's uh that's a, that's a cool <clears throat> idea it just looks so much like like uh an older final fantasy or something the way the characters maybe yeah i mean we'll have to see i mean it's coming out on uh adult swim and uh crunchy roll which you know i'm gonna have to get access to uh one of those uh to check out this show um it you know, I'm always down for a new Blade Runner thing. And I think once Blackout came out, I think that kind of showed people you could do Blade Runner in in animated form. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm all for that. I, I can get past this animation style if it's good enough. All right. It was just kind of my initial feelings on that. Sure, sure. Well, if you can, you know, accept the animation style, then uh Blade Runner uh, Black Lotus is coming out, I believe, uh, November 13th. Uh, again, on Adult Swim and uh, Crunchyroll. Um, so that'll be this week when this comes out. That's true. Yeah, it's actually yeah. this week. You know, but, you know, it's, um, but yeah, if you're a fan, check that out for sure. And uh, well, I think so. Yeah, at least I'll, I, I don't know, I'm going to, try and check it out and then maybe we talk about this on the show next week but yeah, yeah that'd be good yeah um all right well the next uh thing on our agenda is uh let's talk about this uh this movie guys the eternals um mm. i'll start out by saying and i i'm saying this knowing full well that uh i'm in the minority here um I uh, the this movie has a shot of uh, getting on my top ten list for the year. For the year, yeah. I didn't the, think about it like that. No, no. I well, I mean, I, I when I you know try to think of like some of my favorite movies for the year, you know, I I tried to do like a top ten, and this one has a shot in my mind. Um, it might yeah. not. It might not totally make the cut. I mean, it's it's definitely one of the ones that, you know, if there's one, if I sat down and really processed my feelings about it, and it's like, eh, I kind of like this one a little bit more, this one's going to probably get knocked off. But as it stands, I really liked The Eternals, and it seems that uh, that uh, I am kind of, uh, kind of alone somewhat in that opinion. You mean amongst um, the three of us or amongst general? No, just amongst general. Well, yeah. see, I know people that people in my friend circle who like, okay, so I know people who gave like Wonder Woman 1984 like a D plus and uh, yeah. they, they gave this movie an F minus minus. Like they, they hated, I, they hated yeah. this movie. Where I come at it, like when I was comparing it to other stuff I've seen, I was comparing it to other like sci-fi and other Marvel movies. And I think it's way better than some of the worst Marvel movies. It's, it has a lower score than like Thor 2 yeah. and uh, a, bun yeah, a bunch of bad yeah, ones. It, 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 yeah. It's like the one MCU movie that has a rotten rating. I think it's the only one, yeah. And that's kind of astonishing because I would rate this much higher than... Um, you know some of the more average you know like it like let me put it this way if there if most mcu movies are hitting like 70 or 80 i think this one deserved like a 90 on rotten tomatoes that's kind of where i'm at with it i would agree with that statement on with the caveat that i don't think most right marvel <laughs> movies deserve nearly that high rating but i would say yeah this is it's a better movie than than what, the average what marvel i would movie. expect from marvel but yeah. the thing is it doesn't really feel like a marvel movie like when the Iron Man gets brought up in conversation, I was like, oh, right. I forgot this was Marvel. And then when yeah, they bring up Superman, I'm like, wait, is this DC? <laughs> and I just got confused for like 10 minutes. And then I guess they just referenced DC, they referenced Superman as like a fictional character in Marvel. <laughs> like, yeah. That was weird. But 
Yeah, for me, all the to- all the Marvel tie-in stuff was easily the weakest aspect of this it movie. Felt, it felt shoehorned in, like the line yeah. she has about like, "Oh, we were instructed not to intervene unless it was deviant related." Sure. Mm. Like, well, I, I mean, this is the thing that I'm looking at. There's like a lot of people that look at shit like that in in the movie and say like, "Oh, that's such a weak yeah. argument for, you know, how come you know the Eternals couldn't." you know, uh, help with Thanos or whatever. And I'm just looking at, like, that's the thing that Marvel's been doing forever. Like, like it's like, why couldn't Thor help out with this situation? Or why couldn't Iron Man help out with this situation? And nobody ever brought it up because it was just like, well, it's an Iron Man story, you know? But the, the, the thing is, you know... Now they've it, done these big ensemble ones. Yeah. So... But I, I guess maybe that's just the thing. The landscape has changed and people are now used to seeing other heroes from other movies join in. So it doesn't feel like a good excuse anymore. But I, I, at the same time, I'm looking at it like, well, I mean, that's been the caveat for so long. Why is it all of a sudden a problem with this movie? I mean, this like if this were like um, Clash of the Titans or Gods of Egypt or something. And it was just nothing to do with Marvel. I would have just like not been thinking about that at all, and probably enjoyed it as just like a standalone thing. It was it, fine. I mean, it was you barely know? standalone. I mean, aside from like, right. a couple of references to like Iron Man or whatever, it really was kind of its own story, which was really nice and refreshing in my mind. Right, I liked that. So. Yeah, the ass. The for the, you know for the most part, it didn't do too much to reference other Marvel movies, but. I feel like whatever it did, it kind of it took me out of the experience mm-hmm. a little bit. And I think for people who are big Marvel fans, we're trying to get our friends on the podcast who is, but <clears throat> so I'm curious about his take. But like, does that help or hurt it that it doesn't feel very connected to Marvel? Yeah, yeah I mean, it's it's a good question. I mean, the, the, the thing that I'm I'm looking at with this movie Uh, for me and the reason why it's one of the best of the year for me is that it feels much more human and it feels much more um thematically complex yeah more philosophical and yeah yeah than almost any of the marvel movies and you know as somebody that's kind of you know this genre film enthusiast who you know wants to see these blockbuster films kind of aspire to a more, you know, higher art or, you know, this, you know, kind of aspire to the, you know, the grandness of what cinema can be, you know, the Eternals, Mm -hmm. you know, kind of hits all the marks that I wanted. Um, But I, I felt, I felt in a lot of ways as fantastic as it is and as epic as it is, it felt a little bit more real than almost any Marvel movie. Uh, that I've mm-hmm. seen, and I wonder if that's a problem people would have with it. Is that it just doesn't feel like it even fits in that cinematic universe? Yeah, yeah. even in just the look and the editing style, it's completely different from anything oh, yeah. I've seen from Marvel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the way stuff Before. is framed and shot. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. one of the, it's one of those beautifully made Marvel movies I've ever seen because it actually feels like a real movie. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, absolutely. Um, there, it seems like she actually put work in composing shots, you know, right. which I've never noticed in a Marvel movie. Like everything yeah. just seemed to serve the purpose of telling the story before, where she really or just serves more thematic reverse. purposes. And yeah, it, it mm-hmm. almost feels like an indie film at times, um, w- which is interesting. But yeah, a lot of the Marvel movies, uh, you know, with some exceptions, they, they feel pretty cookie cutter. Um, yeah, uh, and this one really felt like there was like an auteur at the helm, and they, for the most part, let that person Chloe Zhao uh, do what they wanted to do. And and I and I think the stuff that kind of feels out of place to you guys, like referencing like stuff outside of the movie, um, and in the other cinematic universe, is almost like that's just sort of you know, maybe a little bit of the Marvel formula coming into play. And it's like, well, you know, we kind of have to... Yeah, it felt obligatory, but it would have been... It also felt like there were some missed opportunities with, like, if this takes place over the Thanos snap, like, I thought, oh, that's how some of these 
dying Eternals are going to leave the plot. Some are going to get snapped away. Mm -hmm. And like uh, Rob Stark's Icarus, whatever his name is, mm -hmm. like he disappears for five years. I was like, oh, he got snapped. But then it turns out he just kind of left. Right. Well, I think it's yeah. an interesting question because it, they say in the movie, and and I guess there is, this is kind of a spoiler discussion. They they do say in the yeah, movie sorry. that that the um that the Eternals are not like living; they're like artificial oh. beings, right? right. So maybe that's they true. wouldn't be affected by the Thanos snap if that's the case. That's fair, I guess. I, I, I mean, I'm not sure what the exact rules of the Thanos snap are, um, but you know, it right. gets rid of half of the life in the universe. And I guess there's Is a that question: like Are the plants, eternals... and animals? And I think it's animals for sure. Yeah, I, I, I think so. I, that's it's a little bit unclear there. But then there's a question of like, are the Eternals even alive? Um, right. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, that was that does kind of lead into another point though it's like a lot of the critics for this movie are saying it's um it's a horribly convoluted film and uh i just didn't get that i was able to follow it you know pretty well um well, i think you can follow it even if it's convoluted i mean it's it's like it's not confusing i don't think right but it does feel like it takes it felt like it could have been like 40 minutes shorter really with what ultimately ends up all happening I mean, yeah, I mean, they, they take the time to sit down and explain what's happening, like, constantly, right. in but there, they, like, just in case keep, you didn't get it, yeah. But then they keep changing what they're, what they're doing, so it, it seems like there's, like, extra steps well, that I mean, maybe could be cut out. Like, like, in what way do you think they're, they're changing what they're doing? Like, at the end with the, the Unimind thing, they take all this time to explain, like, this is how this is going to work, and mm -hmm. we need everyone here for it. Mm -hmm. And then one guy leaves, and they all just kind of do it anyway. Yeah, then and the it, execution of that at the end was very unclear to me. There like, was another that's, scene where that's a small where, detail in my book, but yeah, I was where, like, that's the, that's what the Unimind was. Okay, I guess. Yeah, and Fosters is like, oh, everything I, we just figured out, we can actually do it this way. And I think sure. like Tina is there, and I, I, I mean, it, you know, sure, there's just a lot of scenes of like dialogue and going over the plan and. I, I, I will say this, the, 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 uh, the end part where they do kind of, you know, just sort of do the Unimind thing, and it's unclear exactly how they do it, despite the conflicting factors, that's one of the things about the movie that did kind of, you know, I was like, eh, I don't know how I feel about that, and then at the same, the other thing, and they'll talk about this, was like that one, the, the main deviant thing seemed like a little bit Oh yeah, that was a little bit odd to me. <laughs> that um, was that was like even as far as Marvel villains go, that one was really bad. <laughs> yeah, but but be, beyond that though, I mean, I, I I felt like the story beats were fine. Like I mean, it, it happens a lot where, you know, a, a characters will come up with a plan and then a wrench gets thrown into that plan and then they have to come up with something else. I'm totally fine with that. The only issue I really had was like as you said justin it's not kind of clear how they managed to cobble the plan back together at the end and <laughs> you know that that's really my only thing is like they have to more clearly explain uh that workaround but um you know beyond that though i mean i i don't necessarily have a problem you know with you know uh, you know the kind of twists if you will in, in the storyline Sure. I was, I just, I don't know. I, I was most, I enjoyed the most just looking at it and like the creativity of a lot of the set designs and the shots, the ship looked really cool that they were from. Um, the, the, the big space daddy, the celestial boy, he was cool. Yeah. Oh yeah. But, that was, that was great. But I found myself just kind of uninvested in the characters and maybe it's because they threw a bunch at me that I never knew before. And I don't know, there were a couple I liked more than others, but at the same time, the whole time I was kind of just sure uninvested. Yeah, I, I I mean I think that you know presenting new characters like that you know it, it's it's refreshing because it allows somebody like Chloe Zhao to come in and just you know kind of do what they want without any kind of preconceived notions. And I think the only thing that's really kind of working against her here is the need 
to fit it into the broader you know yeah. marvel cinematic universe a lot of those movies take your current investment and they're like oh you saw this movie with thor or whatever mm -hmm. and you saw the hulk and now you're going to care initially about ragnarok because they're both in it sure or something like that so it, it was definitely a challenge i think it would be easier to do with less characters because there were like what 10 eternals or something yeah there's wow. there was like seven i i think seven or eight yeah because uh, um uh, but I mean, it's an ensemble. Anything. It's an it's it's an ensemble, and you know the thing about it is, I I I, you know, maybe I'm just a little bit more forgiving, but I I I kind of liked how, you know, the I I felt like the length of it was was good. Like I mean, it feels it feels appropriately epic. And going back to like the celestial and that those shots with like when they're commuting uh, communing with that character, it's like mm -hmm. it, it the way it's framed, it feels like you're in the presence of a god, you know. Yeah. And and that's it, it's just there's some really just big shots where you feel the grandness of everything that's happening, and also the fact that these characters are also named after like various gods found throughout like human cultures throughout human history i think sort of lends it all aesthetically to this epic and you know mythological you know vibe that they're giving off for sure yeah. um it like, reminded me of dune with the, the scale and the way it was shot sometimes oh definitely definitely uh there's some you know some dune vibes there it's almost like epic science fiction starting to kind of make a comp come back in a way Mm -hmm. Chloe Zhao was actually taught how to shoot IMAX by Denis Vienna for this movie. Okay. Oh, really? She, she went to visit the Dune set. Oh. In preparation. Well, there's one tie-in for you. Um, Makes sense. Yeah, but uh, one of the things that I really liked about this was that, you know, again, again kind of noting that the Eternals are sort of like a pantheon of like gods and 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 I and I liked how the movie, like talking about how thematically complex it is, I liked how the movie was sort of referencing like, you know, uh, superheroes almost sort of being like the modern mythology in a weird way, like, like, mm -hmm. uh, like, um, like we're talking about uh, gods and we're talking about like how you know the gods communing with mankind and and really, you know, in a weird way, comic books are sort of have sort of taken the the placement of that like all the stories that we hear about like zeus and thor and all that it's um now it's you know and now it's replaced by spider-man and, and all that mm -hmm. right i, I kind of like how the movie is sort of going back to the roots of like you know storytelling and you know the superhumans a little bit for um, sure i i definitely like that that take on that concept from marvel better than dc in the last few years oh, oh they've yeah. been trying to do that with like superman and yeah the justice league and it's just so it's like, it's so like ham-fisted in a way that it doesn't need to be yeah and just like dreary and I, this there's color in this movie that's nice yeah oh, oh definitely <laughs> yeah, the, and, yeah you know there's a lot of a lot of color especially when um you know we're we're looking at some of the uh the various you know uh human civilizations that we you know yeah we see. those were <laughs> some of those sets were like just really fun to just watch watch the uh, action scenes take place on even though the action scenes felt very like <clears throat> you know they're just fighting these monsters yeah um which is cool i mean that you get to show off like what each character can do and that kind of thing but well i mean i think that was appropriate especially like that first scene when they're all getting introduced we're seeing like the the gods coming down and uh, defending early man from these uh these terrible creatures it's like yeah the beginnings of human storytelling in a way and it also mm -hmm. establishes who they all are and what their powers are um they and have the ensemble shot yeah where they're all there yeah obligatory ensemble shot but yep. then it, it flashes forward to the present day and we get this real sense that it's like the gods have sort of become irrelevant um in a mm -hmm. way it's like now they're just sort of like integrated into human society and nobody really 
acknowledges them or even knows who they are and it's almost like you could even you know looking outside the movie you could even say we're living in a world where superheroes are a thing like people are just sort of used to it now anyway right so even if they weren't like you know trying to conceal who they were i mean there's still like this notion that like nobody's really shocked to see a uh you know a superhuman anymore right even kid harrington's like oh are you a wizard like dr yeah. strange right yeah. right right yeah and, and you know and i like that i like that that one was okay yeah well i mean not just that specific reference i like the idea that you know they've sort of you know fallen into the background a little bit and mm -hmm. they've become a little bit more broken over time and you know that's something that you, you know we see i was a little bit surprised by with angelina jolie's character in this film yeah which, uh, which i'm shocked by the way it's taken this long for angelina jolie to end up in the mcu um <laughs> but you'd expect her to be this um you know she'd be playing like this badass warrior character which you know she is but um over time she's sort of a what did they i forget exactly what they called it but she's accumulated this sort of it's mental like memory load like, yeah it's a mental degradation of some kind and um she's just uh you know thana is just broken <laughs> basically um yeah like, like she just goes into these uh these violent fits of um blind rage a little bit because of like there, there's you know the what is it the weight of the um of the the few the, the past like times that the universe has been reset or whatever weighing in on her mm -hmm. it was uh, cool to see the what unique pro what problems uniquely affect characters who can't die or yes. get older like in the case of sprite yeah so, um I was, it was an interesting I, angle for sure yeah and yeah that was something i really liked it's uh, you know you you said it very well like what happens to you know these people that uh that can't die you know that mm -hmm. that live you know they're eternal and you know how that affects their psyche and and everything it's it's kind of like like i was saying like over time just sort of watching them sort of break down and watching them you know uh, you know trying to kind of figure out how to live in you know the societies that they helped forge is you know it, it's an, it's a lot of interesting dynamics in my mind yeah struggling with whether or not to love like a mortal person is a cool dilemma yeah so you no, know there's a lot there that i did like i think in general though it was just maybe a little dry for me and the humor that was in it was usually not working for me so yeah. i agree the humor was a weaker feature of the movie mm -hmm. yeah. sure i mean i didn't mind it um uh, the the only thing i really did mind though was the, the so they're, they're fighting these monsters called deviants which you know are mm -hmm. pretty cool they're like uh they're like these uh these creatures from deep space that uh um I, I i guess as it's kind of explained to us they were originally designed to hunt down the predators of um possible intelligent species and then eventually they evolved to become predators themselves and that's why the eternals were created to fight deviants you know because as the eternals don't evolve they are eternal um, yeah which is you know an interesting concept but then um one of the deviants like the big bad one there's like and this is really the only problem i have with the movie is this <laughs> one deviant uh, evolves to a point where it becomes sentient and it has like this weird monologue in the middle of the movie <laughs> where uh, trying to kind of cast the eternals is like you you're murderers and it feels like really on the nose and really that's like, what he says you're murderers <laughs> yeah well it's it's almost like it's trying to put some nuance into it but it doesn't work and it's just really silly it also doesn't commit it's just like he no, needs a motivation no. i guess yeah and then but. he disappears for a chunk of the movie and then we i forgot that he was even in there and then he shows up at the end uh, to help the uh the uh the bad guy at the end who it's revealed is actually um one of the eternals themselves is actually like the villain of the film and yeah um which which that 
you know, I, I thought was interesting. Um, sure. But then, and then he just gets killed. Um, and so I was just like, <laughs> I don't know why that was even a thing. <laughs> it's a mini boss for uh, uh, Angelina Jolie to fight. Yeah, really. Uh, that was the only thing that really just not, did not work for me. And I guess, you know, I, I, I thought that was just really, really silly, but um, I don't know. It seems to me like a lot of people think the whole movie is just really silly. And I just, I don't know. I, I, I guess I'm just more accepting of what it is, but then there's like certain things like that where it just sort of pushed it a little bit too far. And then I'm like, eh, well, yeah. you know. <laughs> Yeah, it was, it was an interesting experience. And I think it what lens you're going into it with will affect what you think of it. You go into it kind of, if you want more like Marvel lore, I guess it gives that, but not with like any characters you necessarily know. And then right. if, you, if you want just like a, a weird sci-fi uh, Gods of Egypt kind of thing, then just kind of ignore the Marvel references and it stands alone pretty well. Yeah. Most like Marvel references and uh, the way they had to explain everything that was happening, you know, for a young oh. audience, which is what the Marvel films are aimed for. So they had to do it. Yeah. You know, there, the were, there were long dialogue scenes where they just tell you, this is what's going to happen, or this is what just happened, mm -hmm. you know? And if it was like they, when, when she becomes the leader, <clears throat> spoilers, <laughs> of the Eternals and meets with Space Daddy. And he like explains everything to her. I'm like, how many times has he had to do this if he keeps wiping their memories? Right. Well, I mean, uh, you know. maybe it's only when you become leader you get the whole dissertation. Yeah, maybe, maybe. I mean, but you know, I I thought that was you know fine. It's, it's like you got to deposit exposition somewhere. Sure. But sure. Maybe maybe you're right. It could be done but in like a in little Dune, bit more clever way. Yeah, and Dune, it's more woven in through like dialogue and events happening and it's just sure. i think better better no, uh, I, I, I agree with that i i guess the way that i'm looking at this is like as far as like the marvel brand is concerned like that's the thing yeah i i feel like this did that pretty well while you know trying to you know, it was a good juggling act right it's trying to it's trying to do the marvel thing and play that formula and at the same time it's aspiring to be like this higher art form in a way and, yeah. and i felt like it it juggled both sides of that pretty well at least for me anyway i know i again i'm kind of in the minority on this i'd like well, to see a cut without the long dialogue scenes and the marvel references and see how different it plays and mm -hmm. if maybe that would play even better though i think i'd, I'd much prefer a trimmed down cut but yeah, if there's one thing things. i can all the can, long, all the long scenes of them, you know, going through history and all that, keep that intact completely. Yeah. For me, you know, it's just, yeah, it's really the scenes where they sit down and say, "This is what just happened, and this is what we need to do now." Yeah, I really like that set with the white windows and the alien plants behind it, and look like Arrival. That that's the like core room of their ship, mm -hmm. but they were there so often. I just started like not liking it anymore. Even though it was a really cool set design. So yeah. little things like that. But I will completely agree with you in that this is this should not be the worst rated Marvel movie. There were oh, way that's, worse that's Marvel insane. movies. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, doesn't make, that doesn't make sense to me. And that's from the critics. And apparently some people were, you know, throwing a fuss about because there's LGBTQ plus representation. Yeah. And oh, Marvel's woke now, we're gonna bomb review bomb the movie. But the critic score was bad too. Yeah, that well, that's the thing. It's actually last I checked, the the audience score for that for this was actually uh, pretty good. Like I, right. I, I I think it has like an eighty four audience score, but then it's forty nine from the critics, and that just doesn't make sense to me because it's like I would rather watch this movie, you know, a bunch more times than I would like watch something like Thor: The Dark World, which is just <laughs> unbelievably boring. Or the uh, first Hulk. <laughs> yeah, or the, yeah. Or, or wait, are we talking Incredible Hulk or Ang Lee's Hulk? No, the Incredible Hulk. Well, that would be the second Hulk, sir. Right. I don't think Ang Lee's Hulk is in canon, Marvel. It's it's not. It's a weird thing because actually, Incredible Hulk is like a soft reboot slash loose sequel to that movie. But right. it doesn't really reference anything from it. The only thing it really references is that. Uh, 
um, what's his face? Um, Bruce Banner is living in South America at the start of the movie, which is where is that where Ang Lee's ended. That's where Ang Lee's ended. Okay. So it's literally just like that's the only connection. I remember, I remember Ang Lee's Hulk actually being like really entertaining with how weird it was, <laughs> just the I, way I it was edited and stuff. I never saw it, uh, so I don't. <laughs> and I only saw like Incredible Hulk like once years ago, and I, I saw uh, that in the others. <laughs> I wasn't terribly impressed with it um i liked iron man oh. much more oh yeah um, iron the first iron man's great yeah absolutely um but yeah this is not the worst marvel movie in my mind but i don't know what no, do you I... all think did you guys uh you guys watching uh this uh think that uh that i'm uh, just completely full of it and that uh, the no i was just hot garbage or i get where you're coming from and i think maybe i just had <laughs> different expectations or oh well, i was asking sort of i was asking our audience sir oh <laughs> but but uh but yeah. no i mean no i know that's you know that's all good it's all good i'm just you know tell us what you think of the movie in the comments section please i do have one other thing as well ahead, that I, I did some deep diving to figure out what the fuck i was missing about the lore from some of this okay it's like the Celestials, and you guys were talking about Galactus after, and I, yes. I didn't really know what that was. I kind of yeah. knew. Oh, you didn't know who Galactus is? I was I was aware of what he looked like, but I wanted <laughs> to know like why why Galactus. Mm -hmm. um, apparently, though, we were confused how that how Harry Styles is stand up spoilers after credits scene. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Harry yeah. Styles is revealed to be Thanos's brother, Star Fox, and I was wondering how that makes any sense at all. Apparently, Thanos has a deviant gene, and that's why he looks the way he does. Oh. So this brings into question, is he a deviant in the MCU? And if so, why didn't the Eternals do anything to stop him? Oh. He's a deviant. Oh. <laughs> you know, this is the sort of thing why we really needed Marvel correspondent Lucas. I know, I know. I was going to ask him about it. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure where, where he ran off to today, but... Um, I don't know. Maybe we'll catch him next time. We'll see. Um, but Doing not bad about it. Yeah, but that is an interesting point. If Thanos, at least in the comics, is supposed to be a deviant, then it's like, well, then yeah, we're we're the Eternals. But maybe the comics uh, mythos or mythos uh, is different from the MCU. Sure. Yeah, I, I'm sure they changed a bunch of stuff, but yeah. I just thought it was a a weird but, thing. I didn't realize Thanos was just a human that. I, I, didn't purple. Think, I didn't think it was, it was uh, he's infused with the Barney the dinosaur gene or, right. or wait 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 what's the name of that McDonald's mascot oh, Grimace yeah Grimace yeah and Grimace yeah the Grimace gene right and that's how Disney Marvel gets their uh, McDonald's tie-in I can't believe I, I haven't seen that happen I'm surprised oh you haven't there was that was a whole thing was there back, a thing okay yeah, back mind. in like the uh early 2000s it was like a big thing and then they just kind of parted ways after after a time oh man that would have been good for endgame i think it was after um Super Size me came out that disney okay. was like yeah we uh I don't know if this is good for our image anymore. And then they kind of just let their contracts expire with them. But they were uh they teamed up for a lot of stuff back in the day. Mm. Need a reboot of Mac and Me. Yes, get on it. Get on it, Disney. You know, you can you can do it. We believe in you. Uh but, got to cut that up. Yeah, somebody's gotta do Mac and God. Uh, Mac and me. That's sci-fi. We can talk about that on the podcast. Oh, I'm not sure I want to, sir. <laughs> Uh, um but um but no that that's all fun but uh yeah uh, that's the eternals that's our kind of our take on it i think it's pretty good um i'm not sure you guys you know we're kind of more mixed on it but yeah yeah i give it a 6.5 out of 10 yeah i don't know i i would give it a little bit more than that uh but anywho tell us what you think of the movie in the comment section um mm -hmm. so we do have one last uh, topic tonight, and this is something that we're we're kind of throwing in here, um, starting with this episode. Uh, we we've kind of realized that we've gotten a little bit away from talking about Alien uh, on on the show, and it, this is you know this is what the this is what Studio Utani is. This is this is the Alien Channel, right? So we uh, we decided we kind of want to do something each week where we're just gonna 
bring up a topic about uh, something about the alien universe that is that is worth discussing and uh, I wanted to kick us off this week with uh, uh, what could be an interesting discussion we'll see it's um, is Ridley Scott going to get a chance to direct another alien movie and uh, will he or should he will he or should he uh, well I mean I say I say will he because okay. whether or not he should is another question. Okay, um, just to clarify. I uh I don't know. Uh, should should I kick this off or what do you what do you, <laughs> you guys have any Sorry. thoughts on I just that? looked up Ridley Scott age, but I typed Ridley Scott name. But he's <laughs> well, 83 years old, so yeah, yes he is. for yeah. context. Sure. Well, well that's a thing. Yes, Ridley Scott is an octogenarian, but he has shown that he hasn't completely lost it. Um, we just, mm -hmm. me and Justin watched The Last Duel uh, a few weeks ago, and uh, that's a pretty good movie. I was like, we're going into it completely objective. Like, is this going to be a good Ridley Scott movie, or is this going to be a bad Ridley Scott movie? Because he is a real hit and miss filmmaker, but Last Duel was pretty solid. Um, Gucci looks good. Yeah, and, and Gucci, yeah, I'm excited to see Gucci. Um, or is it, it, now it's called House of Gucci or something, yeah. right? I I, yeah. I I don't know why, but, you know, whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And also, I think the stunt that he pulled with, um, you know, what was that, All the Money in the World, that's kind of insane. Like, for any filmmaker, regardless of age. Like, Vic, are you familiar with that? No, I'm not. Okay, so All the Money in the World was originally filmed with uh, Kevin Spacey as uh, Paul J. Getty. And then with all the stuff with Kevin Spacey came out, um, Ridley mm -hmm. Scott took it upon himself because at that point, like the Oscars have already said like, well, we're not gonna consider this movie now. Um, Ridley Scott took it upon himself to reshoot all of those scenes with uh, Christopher Plummer in the role instead. And he did it in a month. And, uh, and, and, and also this happened like a month and a half before the movie was supposed to come out <laughs> his front build yeah yeah so that's a, like that's insane for any filmmaker to do because there's a lot of filmmakers that would say well what can you do right and then you know or you know whatever the studio tries to bury the movie but then ridley scott comes in and says no i have a duty to uh the studio to save this film for them so baby driver came out around the same time and they just kept kevin spacey in yeah yeah i don't know how much different the release dates were yeah i forgot kevin spacey was in that i'm not sure did, was that the baby driver come out at the same time that kevin spacey it was, was yeah it was around then yeah okay. yeah yeah um but 2017 baby driver came out right right but yeah and that was all the money in the world came out like in december of that year so um i mean that's the thing it's like really scott still got it like and even all the money in the world was was a pretty good movie like for sure you know it's just yeah so i i don't know how much his age really factors into his capabilities but i do think we need to talk a little bit about um about prometheus and alien covenant and right. um really whatever you think of those movies um i like them i know i know you two you know like them as well um but they do oh, ha they, they they do have some issues and uh there's no denying that they also whether people listening or not whether you like those movies or hate those movies um there's no denying they both got a pretty mixed reception especially alien covenant um so mm -hmm. i i think the question really here isn't you know does ridley scott still have the capability i think he does i i, I think it's more like what you were saying uh, at the beginning of this baker should he like does uh, <laughs> like is this the right direction the way that he's trying to take the franchise right because like when you say another alien movie i think another alien movie like alien whereas prometheus and alien covenant aren't very much like alien except maybe the third act of alien covenant is trying to be yeah so like if you were trying to recapture and reimagine 
the original movie and make it the scary closed bottle horror story. I don't know how, if he could do that, but I think he could do another cool prequel philosophical movie that is also scary. Mm-hmm. Um, it would just be different. And what we we talked about before on the show is like the first four Alien movies. It's kind of the same movie, but just different directors each time, which is cool. And I don't know what he could, like, what would a sequel, what would Aliens look like if it was Ridley Scott's movie? Well, you know I, think, I, mean? I, I think we kind of know what it would look like, honestly. We, um, you know, because Ridley talked about what he wanted to do for the next alien movie like before you know james cameron came in and he, he was gonna deal all with like the space jockey and all that i i think mm. between prometheus and covenant we kind of saw what he had in mind sure right um and there was a lot of reasons why the sequel didn't come out right away and why um and why uh ridley scott wasn't offered a chance to direct it and it's not specifically because of Ridley Scott that he didn't get to direct Aliens um it was just you know it's it it, you know just comp kind of how it happens how the cards sort of fell uh Mm -hmm. more or less it's just James Cameron was up and coming and then they were someone needed and you know, they, they were talking about, well, we've been trying to do the Alien sequel for a long time, but there's a lot of negotiations with, you know, the producers, David Geiler and Walter Hill, and it comes down to, like, well, James has an idea, Cameron has an idea, and he comes along, and the studio just likes it, and they go forward with it. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but then really, Scott's not happy about that, because he wanted <laughs> to, he wanted to do the franchise, and, you know, yeah. But that's almost a different topic, really. Um, and he's I, executive producer in this new show, right? Yes, yes, he is. He's the executive. I, I think he has to be at this point because right. he's really kind of attached himself to this brand in a way. I, I mean, and with Prometheus and Covenant, like he really kind of came back in a big way. Like, regardless, again, if you like those movies or not, he really kind of you know he kind of asserted himself as i am one of the chief creative you know um uh what would you say visionaries yeah yeah i'm i'm one of the big people on this so you have to have me you have to have some kind of input from me if not sure. just complete like you know um ownership you know which i'm sure he would really like to have uh, mm-hmm. it's sort of been indicated um I guess but, the other question is, is there a demand for another Alien movie? Because like you said, the Covenant didn't do great in the box office, right? So Yeah, that's a that's a good point. And I think this TV show that's already, you know, we know it's going to come out. You know, they're already working on it. Right. Um, if it, you see, now, nowadays with TV, you have to pretty much become a meme to be <laughs> successful. Mm-hmm. Which, you know, it's good for something, yeah. good for some shows and bad for other shows generate memes at least yeah exactly um and uh i think an alien tv show has potential to do well in this climate and if it does that might create demand for another uh alien movie by ridley scott because uh my understanding is he's pretty involved in the tv show he's not just executive producer and name right creative control yeah yeah well he i mean i don't know if you remember if you were there justin but there was like uh Ridley Scott was asked about it and uh his he was asked like you know how's it coming along and uh he his answer was well it's not going to be as good as the movie that I made okay (laughs) (laughs) which um well that's uh that's kind of uh shooting yourself in the foot there a little bit Ridley go team (laughs) yeah um so that does kind of bring up the question to like to what degree he is involved like he is involved clearly but maybe it's not really exactly what he wanted to do so not like his project right Mm -hmm. um as far as like yeah i I mean it is a complicated issue because alien covenant did not do well and there was a clear attempt from um whether it was ridley or the studio or whoever they tried to kind of 
course correct from the direction Prometheus was going and they really tried to make this into we're going to really kind of say yeah for sure this is an alien movie and the positive of that is like Prometheus kind of got brought into the alien fold which beforehand it was actually a separate franchise and um and now all of a sudden it was just like okay now we've actually brought in the world of alien so in that sense alien covenant maybe makes sense like long term um Mm -hmm. but um it also did not do very well at the box office as we well know and actually it was that weekend um that fox announced that the sequel to alien covenant was being put on hold which was for me that was the nail in the coffin it wasn't going to happen um you know whether you know that's good or bad in your mind um I, I, I get, oh, I, go ahead, Justin. Oh, no. Oh, I, 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 I guess I'm kind of mixed on it because I, I like just the sheer weirdness of the mythology that Ridley Scott is creating. And there's almost like that kind of value in disregarding what's established canon. It's kind of like what we're talking about with Eternals a little bit because mm. Eternals almost sort of does its own thing regardless of what else has happened in the franchise like and i almost like that and and i like covenant kind of for the same reason at the same time it's like well you can't just completely ignore that these other things happened right right i think part of what's made alien less scary for me is learning more about it because it's become less alien it's become more known right the more we learn about the alien the more familiar it is so like I watch the first alien now I see the space jockey scene I can't help but think of the engineers and it kind of takes away mm-hmm. a little bit from the original yeah. idea so and, the, and and a lot yeah. of people have in mind with that like the space jockey is a you know is you know for a long time was thought to be like a skeleton of a, of a mm-hmm. creature and now we understand it. it's actually a biomechanical suit an exoskeleton yeah yeah which you know i you know, I'm fine with that. I don't really. It's cool. I mean, it, I'm fine with it. It's just eliminating in the a mystery, sense, like, right? Which it's like shining a light in the dark. Whereas the first alien is very dark and like you don't know what's going on. Yeah, that's sort of what's spooky about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. You know, I think there's definitely a you know an argument there that maybe these prequel films were not the right direction to go, and maybe like. I, I, the question that I put forth is, is Ridley Scott going to get a chance to direct another Alien movie? And the the thing is, like, Fox at the time, before the Disney acquisition, you know, put Alien Covenant sequel on hold. Um, <laughs> yeah. It, you know, is Disney going to be any different? Like, like are they... Like, are they going to be more fair to Ridley Scott or are they going to, or like not fair necessarily, but are they going to be more inclined to like, you know, bring in more in than Fox is? I'm not entirely sure about that. Mm-hmm. Like, and if he even wants to. Oh, I'm sure he wants to. He speaks about think? it all the time about, yeah, we're going to do the third prequel for sure, but oh, he's still he's the, in? Okay. yeah, but the thing is, it's like, he's the only one that's really saying that. <laughs> that, right. that's kind of what i'm getting at here you know I, it's like ridley scott's trying to make himself like the 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 name behind the brand of the franchise but he's the only one that's really doing that mm-hmm. you know i no guess one else... it might the the success of the show i'm sure will sway disney one way or the other yeah that, that's how i feel about it i think that if if the show's a big hit and Disney sees a demand for a new Alien movie, they might go to Ridley Scott and say, mm-hmm. all right, here's your shot. You know, and also I think if Ridley Scott's able to prove he can make money again, because the last time he did very True. well at the box office was The Martian, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Yes. 2015? Uh, yeah, 2015. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and yeah. that movie was uh, was excellent. I love The Martian. Mm-hmm. That, I mm-hmm. think that might have been part of the reason why they let him go ahead with Alien Covenant because the Martian like show sure, Ridley yeah. Scott could make a crowd pleaser, you know, mm-hmm. and in and, space. And, yeah, in and um yeah, in space. Let's not forget that part. Um <laughs> but but 
Yeah, no, I, I think, um, I think the, I think you guys are right. I think the show is going is kind of Disney's way of testing the water. Is about like how interested are people in this property right now? And a, a, a TV show is a little bit of a safer bet in a way mm -hmm. than a movie. Right, lower budget, you mm -hmm. know, more likely to just have somebody, you know, watch one episode of it to see if they like it and then maybe it'll build an audience that way. Yeah. Sure, yeah. yeah. No I, box office story about. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, definitely. Um, I, just, I guess the question really does, it, 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 it is going to kind of depend on what this TV show does too. Like, is it going to go into some of the, the lore that was established in, you know, Prometheus and Alien Covenant at all? Mm -hmm. um, it, it's kind of weird, right? Because Alien Covenant kind of implies uh, uh, that David, uh, Michael Fassbender is the, the creator of the alien. But it, it's kind of weird in the, in, since then, you know, in other media and novels and, and games and whatnot, we've kind of sort of went away from that and sort of implied that, well, maybe the black goo kind of came first and maybe David just sort of reverse engineered an alien. Right. Um, but, but this is a prequel on Earth, right? Yeah. So it might just be different canon history. I knew right. that well that's or that, or well something. that it that would be interesting to see i kind of doubt it because actually they i believe they said that it plays into the the yeah. uh the world that the films established i'm so. curious how they'll pull that off then that's yeah well and because if it takes place like they're saying it takes place in the near future so presumably before even prometheus takes place and i can't imagine having an alien tv show that doesn't have the classic alien in it which if they right. show That's, up that yeah. kind of shows david did not create them that, yeah you know and it was and, on earth before it was up in space with ridley like oh, yeah i mean if, strange it's just a strange angle i and we'll see what they do i mean I'm just saying, if any xenomorph show up in this thing and it takes place before Prometheus, it's like the whole notion that David created the xenomorph isn't a thing anymore. And, yeah. and, and then the question then is, if Ridley still wants to continue with that story, what's he got to change? And, you know, does that, you know, make the, uh, the does that lessen the impact of the David character on the franchise? Mm-hmm. Probably. Still, I mean, you could still look back and say that's like one of the best parts of those two movies. This is David's plot. I, I, I oh. do I do like the David stuff, but yeah, he, right. was, he was the best part of either of those, absolutely. Right. So I mean those kind of have their own place in like, oh, those are the David movies. Yeah. Even if the continuity maybe doesn't yeah. uh, follow through everything. Well, I mean, what I'm saying is like Scott really wants to set up David as like be the mastermind behind the whole franchise and if you know the tv show is doing what it's doing then that's not gonna then david's like place in the story is almost like becomes like a side story at that point right that's what it would become yeah um let's suppose for a moment that ridley doesn't get to make another alien film and I, maybe this is just a completely different question, but do you guys see the possibility of like at some point the David arc getting wrapped up in some other way, like mm. maybe in either like a, uh, a maybe the maybe even in the TV show or maybe in like a tie-in novel or or you know comic or something. I was actually thinking about this the other day. I was thinking, well, since if Ridley Scott's working on this TV show, and given the way that nowadays with the TV model, you could do a standalone episode of a right. running TV show and nobody would think anything of it. Mm -hmm. So what if most of the show is this story about Earth in the near future, and then all of a sudden one episode is just Michael Fassbender mm -hmm. out in space? Yeah, completely yeah. removed from the rest of the story. Yeah. It'd be hard to sneak them into the Earth plot, so it would have to be right. something like that. Well, but, I mean, you, they have big actors in TV shows all the time. No, I could see not... with the show, because Ridley Scott is involved, and he might want to kind of give that cameo that, like, 
you know. I mean, I mean, for all we know about it, Michael Fassbender could have like a sure a big could be. role in the in the show, right? But, I mean, this could be the story. Like, we don't know much about this, but this could be the story of like how Wayland uh, at this time in the timeline it would be it'd still be like Wayland Corporation could be like how they found out that hey there's stuff out there that we could maybe turn into a bioweapon right mm. it, it, you could definitely tie it in with the show outside of that though if there's ever going to be like another director who decides mm -hmm. to continue Covenant and Prometheus I, 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 I doubt, doubt that yeah, it, I, yeah there just doesn't seem to be a demand um, from anyone <laughs> yeah Except, but it would be cool i would like it i, I, would um, I don't know how michael fassbender feels about wanting to do the character again oh i'm sure he wants to i'm, I'm i mean it's it's his movie i mean especially right. of, i mean it's his franchise especially as of alien covenant like really kind of making like i always kind of looked at it prometheus like david was the secret protagonist of that movie and then in covenant he becomes like the official protagonist of of the sure you know, they kind of turned the elizabeth shaw thing into um they turned that story into a david story um mm -hmm. which you know for me that's probably part of the reason why covenant didn't do well i think for sure there's some yeah there's a few, regardless, a covenant. this is the reason yeah. why i'm mixed on it a little bit is because I, there's a lot that I like about Alien Covenant. I, I love that it's like a gothic sci-fi story with, you know, Frankenstein's, you know, monster, you know, or, you know, Dr. Frankenstein is this, you know, maniacal AI and the haunted house is like a, a dark and, you know, scary planet, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, at the same time, I look at it like Prometheus had a really great thing going for it. And you had this great character in Elizabeth and then she just dies off screen. Yeah. And then it, it feels a little bit like, oh, okay. Yeah, if there's ever a third one, hopefully Michael Fassbender's in it only for the through line of some kind, because mm -hmm. I'm sure all three movies would be pretty different at that point. Yeah. Um, and I think that's another thing. Hope, but... I think that's another thing, too, is it's not entirely clear exactly what Ridley is going for, especially since that yeah. Prometheus and Covenant kind of like, you know, they're very different in a lot of ways. It's, it's like Prometheus sets off on one story and then Covenant like totally changes the direction of that story. And then it's actually mm -hmm. not entirely clear where it's going and yeah. I think and then it, the, the end just tries to kind of recapture Alien 1. Yeah, it just sort of threw, I think it kind of threw people off and people are like, uh, I don't know what's happening. I don't know why I should care. And I don't know if I'm, this is worth putting the energy uh, in to really kind of figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. You, know, um, you know, that's kind of the way I see it. Um, so I guess, you know, going back to the original question, will Ridley Scott get another shot uh, at directing another movie? Maybe. Um, mm -hmm. I personally kind of doubt it. I kind of doubt it too, but I hope so. I, I in, you know. there's that little twinkling in the back of in the back of my eye. Right? So it's like a yeah. <laughs> I kind of want to see Ridley Scott just go bonkers and do like whatever he said the third one was going to be like war of the worlds or something and I'm right like, i would much rather he go off the rails yeah, than yeah. back to basics that that's what i'm saying it's like it's almost not interesting at this point to try to set up how the space jockey ended on lv426 i just want to see his bonkers engineers versus colonial marines versus david versus aliens bullshit <laughs> it's like it's almost like so insane i'm like come on just just let him do it before he croaks you know come on disney <laughs> uh but at the same time it's like he'd churn know, it out too when yeah, you take that he, long to he make would. he absolutely would i mean ridley scott has not lost his touch which is the argument i was making here it's just a question of like what does disney feel is the value of this property is it some mm -hmm. is, do they feel like ridley's direction that he wants to take the franchise is that the right way to go with it, um, I, I think there's enough factors working against it that 
unfortunately, at least in, for me, we're, I don't think we're going to see uh, that, that conclusion. Um, but I, I do feel like there will be other alien movies for sure. And whether or not yeah. Ridley Scott is involved with them, I, I, I kind of am leaning towards this point. He's not going to be allowed to direct. Uh-huh. That, that's kind oh, of my boy. feeling. That's kind of my yeah. feeling on it. Yeah, uh, I feel you. I, I mean, I tend to agree, unfortunately, but I'm, I'm hopeful, you know. Hopefully this show does well and people love it. Mm-hmm. And uh, well, maybe we'll get something else. Yeah, we'll see. But uh, for our listeners, what do you guys think? Do you think Ridley Scott will get another chance or do you think he should get another chance uh, uh-huh. to uh, take on an alien movie? I, the you know, there's there's kind of a perverse desire in me to want to see him just do what he will, but uh, at the same time, uh, I don't know how audiences in general feel about it. Um, seems like they uh, they might have wanted something different, and Disney's probably going to want to cater more to that uh, side. Uh, is what I be thinking? Mm. Yeah. But uh, anyway, that's our uh, that's our show for this week. I uh, I hope that you uh, enjoyed our discussions today. If you like this uh, video, then show it by giving us a like. Um, if you like uh, what we're doing here, subscribe to the channel for more episodes. We've been doing this weekly, and uh, yeah, drop some comments before uh, below. We'll be uh, we'll be watching. Next uh, week is going to be what Blade Runner uh black lotus discussion probably yeah well now uh, well now the now that we've committed to it uh <laughs> yeah we're gonna be watching black uh, lotus a new Boring, uh, show. any big sci-fi news that happens but yeah sure and that's uh that's the story mother uh thank you all for watching this is uh matt baker and justin last survivors of the studio yutani podcast signing off no one can hear us scream <laughs> they will now. Oh, no.